it comes to the nutrition rates worth mentioning. 2022 data show that women in healthcare are leaving their jobs at higher rates on average than previous years. Attrition was especially acute at the entry level and the C-suite level. That means at the beginning and when they go to the highest level of promotion. So both ends, attrition rates were very high. It's rising from 6.4 rate to 16.6 now over the years. If you take past three years, I mean, Okay, sorry for the technical things. I think this needs better compute, <laughs> right? Okay, now I'm coming to the report by World Health Organization and Women in Global Health. Together, they co-produced a report delivered by women led by men. Because this report highlights how gender inequalities in health and care will negatively impact women, health systems, and health outcomes. And underinvestment in health systems leads to a vicious cycle of unpaid health and care work, which lowers women's participation in paid labor market, harms their economic empowerment, and hampers gender equality. This is an analysis of 104 countries provides robust estimates of female participation in the health workforce, occupational segregation by gender and the gender pay gap. It is released in 2022. These are very uncomfortable facts but worth exploring. As report revealed, the barriers faced by female health workers undermine their well-being and livelihoods, hold back broader gender equality and negatively impact health systems. 24 million of the 28.5 million nurses and midwives globally are women. That means only 4.5 million are males. Men, on the other hand, are more likely to be physicians and specialists than women. In addition, more men reach leadership positions, as I have mentioned already, leaving women underrepresented in senior higher paid roles. And outside the formal labor market are the women whose work in health and social care is not even recognized, let alone paid. It is estimated that women in health contribute 5% to global gross domestic product. That is, as I mentioned, three US dollars, three trillion annually, out of which almost 50% is unrecognized and unpaid. Coming to our own paradise island, let me start when you say women in health, not only doctors, not only other professional categories in the family of health, but our minister source, important because political commitment is very important. Many it is a really lady it is advantageous. When you take all 28 ministers, two of them, they held two terms. Only five are ladies. First one, Vimala Vijayvardhana, was the third health minister starting from Mr. W.R.D. Bandana, third minister. And then the 13th one is Honorable Shivagami Obeshekara, fondly remembered as Shiva Obeshekara. She was the 13th. And then 15th, Honorable Sunetra Narasinghe, 
the trend was okay, 13, 15, and also 17 was Sonomal Renuka Hera. And after that, 26th one was Sonomal Pavitra Vanyaraji. So only 5 out of 28, 3%, 18% of the ministers only. At least 25 is not reached. And one minister held the portfolio of health and women's affairs. Usually when it is women, women's affairs, probability of uh, appointing a woman or lady is greater. So that is why. So definitely that out of five, that means it becomes four, the usual probability. But this was the occasion and the situation. Coming to our own health sector, I take the government sector. Private sector is cross-cutting because uh, uh, most of our categories work in the government sector and private sector as well. Exclusive private sector is uh, relatively small when it comes to uh, especially in mode care, uh, outward care, I mean, uh, outpatient department that's 50-50, but still uh, uh, the human resource for health comprises mostly government. Total healthcare workers, we are now more than 150,000, you know, little more than. Females are 68%. What did I say when I said the global context? 67. So we are almost equal. Like, so force. 68% are female. 32% are males. Right. And when it comes to administrative grade, we have taken only here the medical administration. Females are only 26%. So that is also similar to global. And when it comes to specialist consultants, females are 36% only. Though usually when you take a batch at a medical faculty, the sum of but coming to this stage, naturally, it is being reduced. So, and when it comes to executive so-called C's, so it will say, but I have taken this at least DDG and above, only 25% because only we are three out of among our male colleagues. If I take additional secretary, nowhere because I that, that is why I took the statistics from DDG level at least. So it is only 25%. So when you take all non-medical, it comes to about 30%. Because SLAS officers, I think they have better proportion of females uh, when you consider compared to medical administrators. And coming to specific uh, HR and human resource for health, exclusive gender categories. You know, uh, at your left is male dominant. That means PHIs and drivers out of all healthcare workers represent 3% because they are exclusively males, drivers and public health inspectors. And coming to our own female PHMs, that is primary healthcare workers, midwives, out of all healthcare workers, they represent 6%, both institutional and public health midwives, because they, because of them, we are at the stage where we are today, primary healthcare, and all elimination targets we have achieved because of our strong primary healthcare infrastructure, delivering to the doorstep and of their commitment and their uniform training 
I must say. So this female category has, with all due respect to all of us, others, but special mention in this should be rendered for primary health care work. Because we are the proud owner of most of the WHO stipulated targets in the region, achieved first before others. Coming to the conclusions, promoting more women's participation in is re requires target attainment. Spelling mistake, sorry. What can we do? Systematic review and meta and synthesis of evidence in the sector, but things are available mostly. You need to act really. Advocacy is needed, promoting gender equality and due recognition and creation of comprehensive strategy, not just talking. There should be organized methodical way of forward. And understanding their strength by themselves, we also should understand our weaknesses and our strengths. Most of the time, women, they don't know about their strength. Just accepting stereotype way of working. And the situation as it is. No interest or never thinking of development. Leadership development programs should be guarded and remove workplace gender biases. Finally, I want to say that giving this opportunity made me really think of what I also can do, certainly, because if you take the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka, doing well despite of uh, calamities, from time to time we face the calamities, disasters, man-made, uh, natural, worst ever economic crisis, but still, we are maintaining, especially our public health services. And when the real time comes, this resilient public health services will go forward. We are determined to do that. But we really lack a uh, center of gender. I know that. Uh, it's a tiny bit of things are being done at the directorate level, but we appreciate that what is going on, but I think it should come from a higher level. The policy directive should be taken because when you take all the categories, the due recognition, due promotions, due places not given. So together, I think we can change this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam, for those final inspiring uh, words. And um, as a person who um, all the time from my own professional life, talking about equity, equality, hearing those words of a positive nature from an administrator is like putting um, honey uh, into my ears as well as my, my own heart. Thank you, madam. The next uh, uh, speaker is another luminous academic in the field of medicine, as well as uh, uh, in the field, I would say, about women's health. And it's none other than
Professor Chandrika in Gujarat. Uh, Madam Chandrika is a senior professor uh, in reproductive uh, medicine faculty of medicine Colombo. And she was the former vice chancellor of the University of Colombo and the past president of Sri Lanka Medical Association. And I know she was one of the um, chairpersons of the Women's Health Committee to the post I'm holding today. And uh, she was also uh, the president of uh, Ceylon College of Physicians and Endocrine Society in Sri Lanka and uh, physician or endocrinologist with the focus on women health. And uh, I, she, she sent a very brief CV. And, uh, but uh, I felt it's not, if I didn't even look at her web in the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, I would be ungrateful to that sort of an academic. So I uh, looked into it and put very small paragraph from her website. She is the first endocrinologist in Sri Lanka to be appointed to an academic position, a pioneer physician in women's health, obstetric medicine and reproductive endocrinology in South Asian region. And that list go on from national to international awards. And as a researcher, her publications, international publications, the numbers, now we all the time talk about publication and numbers, 181, and 8,301 citations. So that number itself shows the quality. She had said in her short CV, she's committed to encourage Sri Lankan students to be self-directed learners with a holistic outlook. And the second point she has said, address prevention and control of chronic non-communicable diseases in Sri Lanka and the South Asian region. And finally, multi-sector coordination in achieving UN SDGs for Sri Lanka. She is one of the women who uh, went into the top of academia as the vice chancellor. And I'm coming from another university, another female vice chancellor, whom I'm very proud to stand, Professor Milan Pelissi. And so, Madam said, women in hierarchy is about. 25%. Uh, but in universities, again, the number I think Prof. Chandrika will tell us. So I'm inviting her. Her topic is I, I said, how to balance this life as a woman's duty and the career. So she's going to talk on that and I cordially invite and none other than senior professor and a former vice chancellor professor Chandrika N. Vijayra to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Pradhan Ruddhi, for those very uh, humbling words of introduction. Uh, Mr. President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, past presidents, my teachers, and my students and colleagues, uh, and all those who have joined us online. A very good afternoon to you. If I could be helped with trying to find my slides, I would be very grateful. But in the meantime, I would like to say that when I was invited to this uh, symposium, which I thought was very apt uh, by this very vibrant group of 
uh, academics and uh, public health experts as well as women's experts. I was so extremely grateful for them to have picked on this topic of uh, addressing the Women's International Women's Day marked on the 8th of uh, this same month. But as Ms. President said, uh, every day of the year should be in uh, support of women. So I hope I am seen and heard adequately by those who are online. And my uh, task is really having uh, Dr. Somatunga having set the stage on the women's workforce in the health sector to get on to some reflections on career choices, job satisfaction, and work-life balance. So at this point, uh, while uh, declaring that I have no conflicts of interest, I would like to pay my humble tribute to many of those uh, who have passed on, who have kept the flag flying, particularly Professor Priyani Soisa, uh, Professor Dulita Fernando, and of course, those who are with us, such as uh, Prof. Anoja, Professor Jennifer, and also Professor Kumudu Vijay Vardhana, who have been great sources of strength over time uh, in discussing these aspects, in as much as there's a long list of ladies, as well as gentlemen, who have kept uh, my brain sticking over the past several decades. I would also like to uh, share with you some pictures and stories along the way, since as was uh, shared with you, uh, the fact that uh, I chose, it was by choice that I got into women's health. Uh, it was not an accident. Uh, and I would like to say, I'm ashamed probably, to say that I didn't want to treat men uh, who in internal medicine were predominantly for alcohol and smoking. So that was why one reason why my quest for turning into women's health, uh, which was much more rewarding, particularly in the obstetric fund. So before I move on, I would like to share with you this great saying of several two centuries ago, of you educate a man, you educate a man, but you educate a woman, you educate an entire generation. And indeed, Sri Lanka has led the way uh, by being much more equitable in uh, attitude towards women empowerment through education. But I would like you to uh, pause for a moment to think of the woman in the medical front in this 21st century, the third decade of the 21st century. After all, we women medics have to match the expectations of futuristic societies. So while I will share some stories, I will also, uh, that is my stories through my career path in service te teaching and research, to also depict some of the important data uh, which were obtained predominantly from Prof. Uh, Jennifer Pereira, and I wish to thank her in public for sharing those slides with me. So what are the highs and the lows of the 21st century female medic? And I believe that if we identify the gaps and try to mitigate their impact, that we are likely to enable this same Women's Health Committee to carry on the legacy for it to be truly fulfilled. So before we talk about the medics in general, what about women in the 21st century in our country? Uh, I would like to address this, uh, if you permit me, to talk about the four R's of her need and society's need to reprioritize values and be conscious of the women's resourcefulness, as was mentioned by Dr. Somatunga, resilience, as well as respect for her work-life balance. So given these, I am sure we could have fulfilled and contented women, not only in the health sector, but beyond, since through health and through an educational process, we can achieve so much more than just giving uh, health because there is well-being as well. So in terms of reprioritizing our values, it is really about parenting, about education and societal impact. In terms of my 
research interests, uh, as was mentioned about women's health. I've been able to observe the one and the same woman or groups of women throughout their life cycle. And that has given me opportunity uh, to really value the importance of holistic education and to be able to develop a broad outlook. So let me share with you this case study of Miss Asha. It's a, a pseudonym. She's 16 years, about to sit her O-levels, brought by a very anxious mother, aunt, and grandmother, who always answered her, the questions that I asked Asha, which is a common Sri Lankan trait, I'm afraid. And their main complaint is she's not studying, she's moody. But in actual fact, she's loaded with books. She's loaded with unhealthy foods, as Dr. Lakshmi Somatunga would truly know, based on her step surveys and others. And their main aim is to make her a woman doctor. So this is pummeled into her head from day naught of her most important phase of life of going through adolescence and trying to cope with these changes in her body to be pummeled with this thing, study hard and somehow become a doctor. I'm sure many of you would like to recall what you went through at home and in school and maybe the tuition class of a similar rhetoric. As you know, this was one of my key areas of polycystic ovary syndrome, which is the commonest endocrine disease of women, which is a lifestyle disease. It afflicts as much as 13% of women in some societies, including ours. And beyond the clinical and biochemical and endocrinological issues, it is truly a huge psychosomatic issue, psychosocial issues. And when it comes to the cosmetic issues, for example, there are huge cultural restrictions in our schooling system where they are not allowed to go to the beautician and do their, you know, clean up their hair, the excess body hair. And there are so much of prescriptive practices practiced even in today's educational world, which create innumerable amount of damage, mental agony. In as much as prescriptive parenting, as I mentioned, exam-oriented living, the lack of empathy and inappropriate values. So this girl, for example, is just telling, just an eye-opener about the kind of issues that these girls have. In fact, now the international guidelines are predominantly talking about the stigma associated with this condition. And that is what we as medics, particularly women medics, need to empathize. They feel miserable, they feel dejected, they feel blamed, they are not treated like human beings, and the list goes on. And the fact that they lack in beauty because they think beauty is expressed outwardly. And in fact, it was a psychologist, Dr. Achini Ranasinghe, who came forward to study this in her PhD and really address the issues of shame, defeminization, poor self-confidence, and depression. So I won't bore you with all the facts, but the fact that there are a large number of maybe would-be medics in the future who have probably been made to study, be in one place, adopt unhealthy lifestyles, and are afflicted with such diseases or disabilities, and who are very depressed when they get into university. So extracurricular activities have been canceled and they are fed up with life and they hate studies. So had these mothers and daughters been a bit more self-reliant, been able to access scientific information properly in today's world of social media, comprehend, identify their biopsychosocial needs, they might have been able to make their own options. And that is probably where our educational process from school onwards has been faulty. If I were to recall the academic and administrative snippets, which Prof. Jennifer was there as Dean Medicine, and there were about four or five others uh, in law, in faculty of graduate studies, uh, as well as in uh, indigenous medicine and the librarian who were taking on good leadership roles, I must say, 
but that was in the past. Now I think it is zero. But when we were to look at these graduates, if we were to look beyond medicine, that the aspiring graduates often had unfulfilled expectations. They had no space to realize their own talent and capability because it was rushing from one exam to another, or that's what they thought it was. So in terms of these, there were so many different and diverse groups. They beat about their, the type of education, be about the learning process, to whether they are actually sure of a job, whether they belong, and also the, the gap between STEM subjects and the humanities, which is so important to have a mixture of both if you are to become a well-rounded professional. So in fact, we lack the development of soft skills, the active development of soft skills through holistic education, a real uh, sense of civic responsibility to be inculcated in these girls and boys of uh, uh, the future and to think of country before self. And that is something that I would like to emphasize even though this is only a woman's health forum. So getting back to the women workforce, I would like to say that now I have lived my six and a half decades, the highs of low, lows of our Sri Lankan society has not been forgotten. And I still believe that acquiring social consciousness underpinned by holistic education, particularly through women's empowerment, can impact all of our society. So if you look at the educational process, I, I know this has been mentioned so many times since 1945, the Kannangara policies have ensured that there was equity and that there was equity for girls and boys as much. And the Sri Lankan sociocultural structure has encouraged girls to be empowered through the educational process. And this is predominantly so because the school girls drop out much less than the boys. In fact, uh, there was another professional who came up with a question, what has happened to the boys? So anyway, that is another uh, title to be discussed, but as was uh, shown by uh, Dr. Lakshmi Somatunga as well, there are almost two girls to a boy at university entry in today's this decade. Not only in medicine, but in the humanities, but not so much in the IT groups and the engineering and the technology groups. So that's where the boys go. I do not know whether this is because there are different forms of uh, entry uh, criteria in terms of the examination uh, procedure and the outcomes as to whether the rote learning process is less in those fields that the girls do go to less because the girls would follow orders like what I depicted to you about Asha. In terms of the gender mix, career choices is what I need to address. Of course, undoubtedly with a civic responsibility and a global outlook. So to quote Prof. Jennifer Pereira, thank you, Jenny, for sharing your slides with me. Your, these are the very same slides with a slightly different color combination, which you presented four years ago. In the medical group from the 1990s, from being 43%, women at entry and graduation have increased to 60% in the current uh, decade. And the issue is that we have that number of girls qualifying as medical graduates, but their furthering of career prospects have not matched beyond graduation. And this is, she thought, Prof. Jennifer, that it may be due to non-challenging work, low stress, subordinate, and financially less productive jobs being taken by the women medics is likely to be due to their traditional gender roles. So let's see what she found. Basically, as uh, Dr. Lakshmi said, to stay away from decision-making, leadership and administrative roles, is it passive or is it active, this difference. So undoubtedly, it's a woman's role to keep the home fires burning, to look after the family, to prioritize family, and without families, we don't have future. So we, how do we get this? 
correct balance. So as mentioned earlier, the worldwide data are much the same. They prioritize the women, prioritize family commitment. They are more likely to remain single. And their choices in having children versus career paths are often very, very connected. Of course, the data was passed in Asia and Prof. Jennifer's uh, reporting and publications have indeed uh, shed a lot of light. You can see from her data of the MBBS graduation uh, in the latter half of the first decade of this century that the boys, more boys got simple passes while the girls got far more classes. While the boys outnumbered the girls in her total student population. When she looked at medical officers, I believe in the Colombo uh, group of hospitals, and she found that it, it matched the women who took to further careers, matched those who took to medicine. About 44% only took to furthering their careers as postgraduates. And in fact, becoming specialists was only 35%. Why? Is it marriage? Is it children? Or is it having a doctor's spouse? Was also another question that she, which matches most of us, unfortunately. Now, when it comes to the, these were the areas that she, you know, the Columbia Group of Hospitals, and she found that they were on average about five to seven years after graduation. There were more women in her sample. Uh, their marital status were more or less similar to the boys. Fair number had got married at the time she uh, enrolled them. But their enrollment to the postgraduate study courses was extremely low amongst the women compared to the men 46% versus 31%. And even planning to get into future postgraduate studies, the girls had not thought about one fifth of them had not thought about it at all at this point of time when they ought to get onto that track in the usual format. So 52% of women in her cohort had not gone into postgraduate training. In fact, the significance of marriage was, she showed, not the reason. So in overall, when she asked them specific questions, they said it's easier to care for the family because the majority of them were married, whether they were men or women, but you can see what their actual situation is. So they did not proceed to postgraduate training due to family commitments. Their choice of specialization was also associated with their family commitments and therefore they did not reach leadership positions. In terms of uh, medical graduates uh, choosing whichever career, it is interesting that the PGIMB in the sole center that provides this postgraduate development, I don't think they are that gender sensitive about this entire issue. Neither is from policy downwards. So you can see, this was the data I got from Prof. Chandani Vanigatunga, the deputy director, just the other day. As of 31st of December, 2023, you can see more women have gone into diplomas and MSc programs, but to the MD program, particularly post MD pre-board certification, the boys outnumber the girls, the reflection of a previous seven years. So we don't know what is in store for the future, whether these are ways of finding gateways to migration is also something we need to keep in mind. It's interesting that the, in fact, the anesthetists we call ladies college some years ago, now they have from 77% have come down to 47%. Public health, community medicine, 71% has come down to 59% in the uh, then and now. And it, the list goes on while dermatology, neurology, rheumatology and the laboratory groups have remained uh, much higher women taking than men. One aspect, since I was in women's health, there was a huge dearth of obstetricians and gynecologists in women. And that is not so in a neighboring India, and that is not so in the US. And I still not got to the bottom of the problem 
but I think that's worth a while looking into it. Because from a, the perception of the healthcare receivers, the recipients, they would far prefer, prefer to be able to share their problems uh, and expose themselves to a woman of the species. Same with psychiatry. Well, there are more women and venereology more women, but not so in surgery, no, uh, even pediatrics uh, has come down than what we had. And uh, Mrs. Dr. Somatunga, uh, medical administrator, there was no data in 2004, and now it shows 11% women. So that reflects why they don't get into the C-suite also. So in 2018, only 12% of the women were provincial directors, 28% were regional directors as per Prof. Jenny's data, while getting into administrative grade, 65% were males. So even though it was probably a more day job at the junior level, you cannot say childcare lapses was the only reason why they didn't take to these uh, specialties. So Prof. Jenny concludes, men and women prefer to specialize in areas that are traditional, and gender congruent. Women may additionally opt for less powerful specialities. Powerful means, I don't know how you uh, define it. And also whether it is lower income generating that the, what the women go for. On the other hand, we need to bear in mind from policy to implementation that the social support systems of women medics is lacking in the increasingly nuclear family structures that we are going through. So we don't have regulated childcare services. We have a disappearance of the extended family structure and maybe relatively short period of fully paid maternity leave when you compare it to the rest of the world, uh, particularly in those countries that have similar health statistics to ours, uh, not economic, but the outcomes. No provision for part-time work, no way of getting back into service after taking a break. So those are things I think we need to give some our minds to. And the last section of my uh, discussion is about burnout. This is a new word or relatively new word. I don't think we use this word that much, but it's a terrible situation of feeling very depersonalized and being inept, maybe with oneself, with one's family or at work. And you are liable to make mistakes and it's very interwoven with mental health issues. And undoubtedly, I mean, our health is includes mental health and that we need to take into account that women medics need that amount of support because they play a dual role. In fact, the personal burnouts that have been reported by Fernando and Samaranayaka, Dulani Samaranayaka from Colombo uh, Community Medicine Department, the personal burnout was 16.2% amongst postgraduates in Colombo again. Work-related burnout was 15% and client-related burnout was 15%. This was in both genders, but I must say that being a woman carried a 2.3 odds ratio. And that was shown in all her data across in whatever way she uh, looked at her uh, subdivisions of data. And also, funnily enough, if they had parents who were both doctors, apparently these ladies had much greater risk of burnout. So we don't know whether those are also busy parents and therefore they um, had some kind of indirect influence on not supporting them with childcare, et cetera. The other is of course occupational factors, high workload, high homework demands, and high emotional demands as well. So I don't know whether that's a gender specific issue where we sometimes take our, to heart some of the uh, clinical issues we come across and are unable to find a solution for which we also need support systems. So my recommendations based on this uh, data is that we need to network and share childcare by maybe pooling providing them skills of work-life balance, women as role models on balancing life and work, and not being gender congruent and making men our co-partners. I'm sure there are lots of men 
and we can recall on numerous occasions in our own uh, lives how the our male partner has been of undue support and been able to look at things in an objective manner and give us that additional support. Over to you, Prof. Jenny and Prof. Joe, who are in the audience. Lessons for more developed settings from them is that had we been able to take on a part-time work, long some reasonably long service breaks if there are issues, regulate child care services, even within hospitals, and also get role models to talk and de-stress them and ensure that the men are their partners. Before I wind up, if I am given two minutes, I would like to say that our girls, our women medics, particularly as medical students, are very resourceful. I've had that first-hand experience where the Mental Health uh, Institute uh, in Muleriava was overridden with uh, chronic inmates. And in fact, we took this on as a Muleriava project through because the medical students suggested it to me as a, the Zonta leader. And we took them, uh, took their cue and helped them to take multidisciplinary interventions as student-led projects to help those women who had to be taught life uh, skills all over again to get back into society after prolonged institutionalization. The girls came up after tsunami. I clearly remember, uh, led by Dr. Archini um, Arsalingam, uh, where medical and housing supports were given to both the North and the South in the immediate aftermath, all led by medical students and law students, etc. Undoubtedly, Prof. Dr. Somatunga showed about the MCH program. I have never stopped admiring the role of the primary health uh, care workers, particularly the midwife who visits the home and talks to the women in their own language and supports them. What about resilience? I have, during my obstetric medicine years, come across so many women who knew they might die, like this lady, of heart, severe complicated heart disease, but they wanted to leave a child behind. Who are we to say that they should not? And I, I believe that women more than men carers feel about it much more because we go through the process with no disrespect to the men. But I remember this woman who had who hardly gained, she was having cardiac cachexia basically and lived in the ward for the, those number of months before she went into premature labor, arrived at my clinic a couple of months later, carrying this beautiful boy. She said she named this boy Shakti that she defied all medical prognosis and that now she continues to work as a mother and a teacher in the North Central province. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we can, even though we are data driven, be able to say that no one should not get into a high risk situation. And that's what we are here for. The other, before I wind up, is about our medical students. We get them from all parts of the world, uh, country. They like what I showed about Miss Asha from more rural areas. We have had girls who have had to go through their O levels and A levels several times to get in due to lack of resources, etc. And when they get in to uh, a strange city like Colombo from far away, there is a lot of out of pocket expenditure which they cannot afford. They have to learn English, they have to learn how to live and be resilient. But there was this resilient, resourceful girl, I don't know where she is now but she came out as one of the smartest lady, young women medics uh, in Sri Lanka. But she was supported by her aunt who worked as a housemaid in the Middle East. I took this picture when I was uh, out there in transit in one of these Middle Eastern countries and I see these women whom we are all relying on for the Forex, the much awaited uh, foreign exchange where as Maya Angelou says, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by, by the moments of what takes our breath away. So before getting on to the next topic of gender-based violence, I would also like to remind you that when it comes to the issues of ragging and gender-based violence, the girls are the vulnerable groups. Prof. Jenny has done a lot of work on this, and I can, I'm sure she'll be able to share with you data, and that should be data-driven, when we take action. 
And of course, Sri Lanka's first national survey on violence against women showed that one in five ever partnered women, 15 years plus experience physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. And nearly half did not seek formal help. They were too shy to talk about it. So those are the issues that we need to uh, keep in mind that even our own kind could be maybe victims then we need to support them. So respect for work-life balance is something we need to appreciate. I think my time is up. Uh, and really concentrate on childbearing, child rearing, breastfeeding, to make them capable homemakers with social interactions, but also take on the big role of being a woman medic. So thank you very much. But we also need to know that many of us women medics are aging and we might live longer and outlive our men. And therefore, this Women's Health Committee also needs to think of the aging woman medic. So thank you very much. And I would also like to say that we often miss the fact that women can multitask far better than men. I think it's biological, but we need to pay due respect to that. Thank you. And I hope I said some worthwhile uh, information about our current issues of the Sri Lankan medic, woman medic. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for taking up this issue and also to give an insight to the solutions as well. The next person in this symposium um, I'm inviting is uh, Dr. Dinesha Chamari Pereira. And uh, Dr. Pereira is a consultant community physician. Uh, she was awarded Bachelor of Medicine and uh, a BBS um, from University of Peradeni in 2007 and Master of Science in 2011 in Community Medicine um, and Doctor of Medicine in 2015 in Community Medicine from Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo. She underwent an honorary attachment from 2022 to 2023 at Public Health Department of University of Bristol, UK. So very fresh from the overseas training. And she has been serving as a clinician and as a medical officer in public health and as a consultant in community medicine in different urban and rural regions in Sri Lanka from more than 15 years from 2008 to date. She is a key member of National Resource School on Gender and GBV of Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. She has been a member in advanced study team of uh, Global VSC Nepal, Sri Lanka Multi-Country Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Project from 2013 to 2018. She also, she has served as a member in HERA uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Palestine, and Brazil Multi Country Sexual and Gender Based Violence Project from 2020 to date. Currently, she holds the position of a consultant community physician and she is working as the program manager of the technical program on gender and women's health of Family Health Bureau, Ministry of Health. Sri Lanka. So she is one of the upcoming um, gender experts in the Ministry of Health. And she has published her research work in subject areas of obstetric violence, gender and gender based violence, and occupational health. So I know she has done research in a very difficult area of gender-based violence. And I specifically invited her to talk about GBV in, to the patients, as well as among the health staff, which is an issue if we are to have a 
uh, health force, which is healthy, is to be free from violence. So over to you, Dinosha. It's an area where I love manage violence. That's my specialty, forensic medicine. And uh, I would love to hear what you have to say and also suggestions for the future where SLMA can take up at national level, at policy level to bring change. Good afternoon, uh, my dear teachers. Uh, good afternoon, my dear teachers and my role models in my heart and my dear colleagues. Uh, actually, uh, first I would like to thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving me, me this opportunity, especially from the Women's Committee. And special thanks to Prof. Anuruddhi for selecting me to discuss on this topic on, uh, on the day you commemorate uh, Women's National International Women's Day 2024. So uh, before starting the uh, presentation proper, I just like to ask a question from the audience uh, online and physical. Like, uh, can you justify violence in any like under any circumstance from your heart? I'm just asking a question. You, no matter, you don't want to answer, uh, but you can think from yourself. Are there any circumstances where you can justify violence? Like when it is sugar coated with love, if it is sugar coated with discipline, if it is sugar coated with punishment, if it is sugar coated with uh, safety, can we justify? very short answer. No, we can't justify violence under any circumstance because we are humans. That's why I am here to talk on this topic. So I'll be discussing few points on harassment of women in the health sector, not only about our workforce, but also our clients, the patient side also. Okay. But this, uh, actually this would uh, become like a, a collection of some research evidence, but I'll be talking a little bit further to these research evidence. Okay. So these are, this is the outline of the presentation today. So I'll be, I'll be giving an overview on harassment in health sector and especially targeting women workers and then women patients and common contributing factors and uh, what are the preventive and response strategies to be and what is happening at the present and my conclusion conclusion so where are we as a country so just after the independence in 1948 sri lanka ratified Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, as a country, we are bound to protect or preserve our citizens' human rights, including the right to life, liberty, and security. And we have to protect the right of no torture, no cruelty, or uh, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment towards any citizen in our country. So we are bound to protect our people, preserving all the human rights related to no violence, no torture, no harassment. 
So as doctors, as professionals, we have sworn to uh, abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm towards patients, especially from abusing the bodies of men or women. It's, it highlights intentional wrongdoing. When it becomes unintentional, can it be justified in a way? That's the problem. Although it is unintentional, the person who perceives the violence is the victim. She or he is the sufferer. So sometimes we we'll acknowledge that I was not intentional. I didn't intend to do any harm, but there is a suffering. That's a critical point. So all our nurses has sworn the Nightingale Pledge to abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous. But when I asked from one of our uh, nurses in our institution, I asked, uh, do you have any content in your oath uh, to protect people from abuse or like prevent uh, patients from abuse? Uh, no, doctor, we don't have such a thing. That is why free, that's why we freely abuse our patients. That was her answer. She was just joking, but that was her <laughs> genuine answer. Okay. So we have to look at the two sides of the coin. So in the health sector, we can't forget our patients. We can't forget ourselves. So the harassment in the health sector can occur between the health workers and also between the patients. But for the moment, I can forget what is happening in between patients. But I can't forget what happens between workers. And workers can exert power and create violence towards patients and also the other side. Patients will violate the rights of our workers and create a hostile environment with violence. So these are the possible aspects and directions of violence or harassment in the health sector. So, um, but we have to acknowledge that the most common victims, when we consider the health workforce and the patients, the most common victims are the women. And uh, we have to consider this as an occupational and an occupational hazard. Although it happens from the patients or between the workers, it's an occupational hazard if we consider the workforce. And also, this is a human rights violation. So it should not happen. So there are many forms of harassment in the health sector, although it's a patient, although it's a work, worker. So most commonly emotional or verbal harassment and physical harassment, sexual harassment, one of the most serious kind of violation and cyberbullying at the present situation and discrimination based not only on gender, but on race, religion, uh, caste, anything, discrimination also happens in the health sector. And as I mentioned earlier, this can happen over these relations. So what happens if harassment occur in the health sector? So harassment among health workers, that means between health workers is a serious issue that can have detrimental effects on both individuals, the perpetrator and victim both, and well-being of them, and professional satisfaction, and it will negatively affect patient care. So if harassment of health workers occur from patients for significant challenge for their safety and well-being, and professional satisfaction. Definitely, there is a significant challenge for safety of the health workers. And so harassment of patients in the health sector is also a concerning issue. And that can have serious implications for patient well-being 
and trust in healthcare systems, especially a healthcare system where we deliver free of charge. The issue is a huge concern. Ultimately, negatively affect the efficacy and the quality of the entire health system of the country. Although we have flagged with so many good indicators in the region, and we are like uh, comparable with in the, uh, some European countries, but there's a question here. Although after listening to very positive to impressive speeches, here I have to talk about a negative thing, but we have to understand the reality. So although we have flagged this issue of harassment in the workforce or the healthcare system is still there. So let's see some evidence about harassment of uh, women health workers in Sri Lanka. As I mentioned to you, actually we have very minimum research evidence in Sri Lanka to show. And uh, we have to acknowledge that the most common victims are women health workers because although any worker can face harassment at workplace. Uh, the most common victim is female workers, female workers. And the most common, as uh, Songtuga Madam mentioned, the most uh, frequent workforce, most common workforce in the health system in Sri Lanka is the nursing category. So most of the nurses are female nurses. So we have few research evidence about how nurses are getting harassed in their work life. So I have highlighted few researchers. Uh, actually, for the first, very first one I found was from 2018. Uh, there are uh, among 124 mental health professionals, uh, research had been conducted. And out of them, 58% had reported experiencing or facing threats of physical violence in healthcare. And most of the victims were nurses and auxiliary staff. Those are so-called uh, attendants and minor staff. This is by Liana Gaetal in 2018. So it is 58% physical harassment. But there, it was not, um, if there, she had not mentioned uh, from by who they were facing harassment, whether it is from the workers or from the patients. And uh, and Adam et al, and uh, Professor Kovuda Vijayvadal was in this team, uh, she has uh, they have done a qualitative, very rich qualitative study in 2019 uh, about workplace harassment uh, among nursing staff. So they have mentioned that workplace harassment as an epidemic in female, among the female nursing officers in Sri Lanka. And they had conducted uh, focus group discussions among 29 female nurses in a big hospital in Sri Lanka. And they, they revealed that patient perpetrated incidents of sexual harassment as the most threatening and the clearest to identify uh, on, sorry. I'm sorry. Other than like compare to uh, incidents related to doctors and co-workers. That means it was clear to clear for the workers, that means for the nurses to identify the incident of uh, sexual harassment, but they identified sexual harassment by patients as the most threatening uh, condition and situation in the uh, working environment in this focus group discussions. So it's a uh, concerning and uh, an issue like we have to think twice and we have to take measures. And uh, there was another study conducted in uh, 2021 
uh, by Ali et al. among the nurses enrolled in BSc nursing degree uh, at KIU Sri Lanka, the prevalence of experience in harassment in healthcare was 75.5%. And it's obvious that the most commonest type experience was uh, verbal abuse, verbal harassment. It was 87.8% among those 75% five victims. And followed by other emotional harassment, it was 65 among the victims. And there were 35% victims with physical harassment experiences. And unfortunately, 3.8% sexual harassment experiences. And this is, anyway, any violence is unacceptable, but racial harassment, it also was reported 2.1%. Nothing should happen, but this is very unacceptable. And the most frequent perpetrators found to be supervisors of the same sex and also from the opposite sex. 73.1% were supervisors, perpetrators, and followed by patients' relatives, the second most common perpetrators of patient relatives, 53.2. And similar to that, patients were next common perpetrators, 52.3, almost equal to patients' relatives. So this is a huge issue to be considered. So in another study, which was conducted in 2018 among 136 nursing officers from uh, teaching hospital Karapitiya, 64.7 were exposed to some kind of patient-related violence, some kind of patient-related violence that is from the patients. So most commonly, verbal abuse, followed by physical assault, sexual harassment, 90.6% sexual harassment incidents among nurses by patients, and verbal threats, 8.8. So this is a pathetic situation, but this is happening. So here I considered only the workforce. That means workforce, how they harass among themselves and how they harass from their service takers or from their clients. So we have to take prompt interventions, uh, prompt actions to prevent and safeguard our workforce. Because we see how people give up their jobs as Madam mentioned, mentioned in the uh, uh, previous presentation. So in order to keep them in the workforce, there should be a satisfying and safe environment for them to work. So we have to ensure it as a country. So the next side of the coin, harassment of patients in the health sector in Sri Lanka. This is also a topic. It's a... Uh, uh, like it's a hot topic, but no one likes to discuss this because uh, no one expects this to be, and no one likes to hear this topic. But this is also a happening thing. So, I was one of the researchers who was courageous enough to study this topic a few years ago with Professor Gumudu because she was such a courageous person. <laughs> to guide me to study this topic. So I have some findings from my own researches and also one other study which was conducted after the COVID-19 epidemic but by one of my colleagues. So any patient has the risk to experience harassment at any setting in health sector in Sri Lanka as there is a huge power imbalance among the workforce, between the workforce and the patients, actually, unnaturally or naturally created within this free health system. It is a misinterpretation or misunderstanding of our work workforce. Like, they don't give like due respect to our patients with a uh, feeling like, with the, with the feeling of they have come to like beg something, they have come to get something from us free of charge, but no one acknowledged that we are the people who live because of these patients. 
but we were taught during our student period the most important person in your career is the patient but how much we respect that teaching that is a patient so similar to the workforce female patients are the most vulnerable group other than rather than the male patient group because they have the added disadvantage disadvantage of gender, gender disparity. And here also we don't have much evidence, scientific evidence. I have not taken any uh, anecdotal evidence because there are so many paper articles and hearsays, but I have not considered it here. And these are some of them. So uh, this is one of my researches. And so among 1,314 uh, pregnant women who had undergone at least one complete pregnancy, one pregnancy or a childbirth, out of them, 18.1% percent presented with an incident of harassment uh, in health system, in the healthcare system by healthcare providers. 18.1% was that it equal to 238 patients. But obviously, yes, the majority, that is almost all, that is 98% of them had experienced emotional violence, that is emotional harassment, including verbal abuse, and only 4.6 physical harassment, and there were two victims, who had exposed to sexual harassment by some workers, by two workers. And this is something interesting, but uh, need to intervene promptly. The most frequent setting of experience harassment, experience in harassment was labor rooms. It was nearly 50% of the uh, victims had experienced their uh, violence experiences in labor rooms. And follow, it was followed by antenatal wards, and it was in government sector hospitals. The labor rooms and antenatal wards were in government sector hospitals. And the other one, the most common perpetrator was female nursing officers. And it was followed by field and hospital midwives. So we always crown our midwives and nurses who have been that much of competent workforces in our healthcare system. Without them, we can't reach this level as a country. We highly acknowledge that. We highly appreciate that. But we know that they are starting work. They are stuffed with workload. They have they have driven like they have to chase targets. That is how we have come to this level. But this should not be the way. Like they should not convert their stress or tension into the terms of violence or harassment towards patients. That is the wrong way of converting our stress into someone's suffering. So. This is the situation. In the same study, uh, I conducted few focus group discussions and in-depth interviews with victims uh, of uh, uh, victims who had experienced violence in uh, the health sector. Actually, that was obstetric violence. They revealed that harassment towards patients in maternity care setting uh, settings intersect with systems of power and oppression linked to structural, gender, social, linguistic, and cultural inequalities in Sri Lanka. Not only just gender, it intersects with so many other factors. We can't forget or we can't neglect other intersecting factors. Obviously, language, because we are not conversant in all three languages in Sri Lanka. Especially our workforce, public health midwife, nursing officers, they are not conversant in all three languages, but 
our patients are converted only in their mother tongue so that we are not empowered that much to come into their situation, to be empathetic towards their problems and to communicate properly. So this is a huge problem I have identified through my, through my research areas. And the other finding was the victims rarely reported harassment and most common practice was to select another government hospital because most of, most of them were not uh, wealthy enough to select a private sector hospital. They were ready to, happy to select a private sector hospital, but they were not capable of doing that. So they were doing what they were practicing was selecting another hospital nearby the largest next hospital to deliver the next baby. So that was their usual practice. So other than the obstetric violence, one of my colleagues in 2021, she had studied COVID-19 affected patients, how the patients reported discrimination by uh, healthcare workers. Actually, it was a qualitative study. Some in-depth interviews had been conducted. Uh, they have, like the clients have, the respondents revealed that they were treated really bad at hospital do and doctors and staff uh, for, uh, and they refused to see the patients and uh, are seen and uh, treating us from the distance. So this, the, all these measures were taken, taken to protect ourselves, our workforce. But this is the thing we have to understand. The perception of being a victim is very personal. It's personal. No one can measure from outside. That's me, how I feel. So if I am treated in, a, in such a way, I will not rationalize it with the current situation that is the patient, because I am the patient. They will feel like I'm a victim. That is the reality. So we have to understand. So although we have like sworn not to do intentional harm, we are doing a lot of unintentional harm to our patients because we don't consider their perceptions and their, we are not looking at their thought process. So that is something to be considered. But also should, we should not forget we have done intentional harm also because that is why there was physical violence and sexual violence so so these were the more common contributing factors from all the researchers I found, uh, the recent researchers. So the power dynamics and toxic gender. This was very common, common for both, both aspects, towards the patient's aspect and also towards the worker's aspect. The power dynamics, toxic gender norms and lack of awareness and stressful work environment and our unavailability or inadequacy of mechanisms. Actually, it is not unavailability most of the time. It was the inadequacy of mechanisms. There were mechanisms set, but they were not in action. And it was not in action on real time. That was the problem. So these were the most common contributing factors. So, I went through the uh, uh, like uh, interventions. I tried to find out the existing interventions and responses in our country to prevent this this kind of harassment in Sri Lanka, especially in the health system. But as a common thing, these are the common things because we uh, because all the policies and all the strategies. As health, we have to be under the uh, policies and strategies of the country. So that under the penal code uh, 345 section, uh, sexual harassment is a criminal offense because uh, we we saw of sexual harassment also uh, occurring, happening in the health system, health sector. And 
there is uh, ILO, uh, uh, from the ILO, International Labour Organization, in 2013, the Code of Conduct and Guideline to Prevent and Address Sexual Harassment in Workplace is being published. But I know that there are uh, workplaces which is under ILO, especially in the private sector. They adhere to these guidelines. They have set up uh, some uh, like committees and they have their own strategies within their own settings. But how much or to which extent our government organization have adopted these guidelines? That is a problem. We, as healthcare sector, health sector, we have set up national strategic plan Healthcare quality and safety in Sri Lanka, the strategic plan from 2021 to 2025. So they are uh, concerning to the basic concept of health. First, do no harm through the national policy of health quality, uh, healthcare quality and safety. Ministry of Health has advocated wider spectrum of quality improvements including patient safety and enhancing patient satisfaction. So this is more towards patient safety and patient satisfaction. We are at a, uh, like, uh, like we can be happy about this level of interventions, but the we have to question what is the level of implementation. Lakshmi Madam may be knowing definitely more than me to which extent these things are implemented in our health sector. And this is another example. So I have that example in my head here. So with the support of Sri uh, SLMA, Family Health Bureau in 2016 uh, developed guidelines to address sexual harassment in workplace. Uh, so this is not for all workplaces. This is for health workplaces, especially for the hospitals. So in 2019, although the guidelines were developed and published in 2016, we could launch the uh, intervention only in 2019, selected, uh, in selected teaching hospitals as a pilot. But, always I put the question, but to which extent the pilot was successful? This got the least priority among the administrators of the hospitals because they have to set up a committee because there is there are two arms of responding to the victims, formal arm and the informal arm. For the informal arm, they have to set up a committee. So there were no volunteers to set up the committee. They were not happy to be in that committee. They are not ready to listen to these pathetic stories. They are not ready to empower these victims. That is the story behind. So that this was an utter failure. So now we are rethinking now how to reintroduce this from or rebrand this in a way that this because this is needed. So many things are happening. So this is a necessary and timely intervention to Sri Lanka. So we plan to rebrand and relaunch this uh, intervention with the support of our Madam Special. And uh, NINMH, National Institute of Mental Health, actually there are few organizations, there are few institutions in Sri Lanka where they have their own desire and commitment to do such things. So NIMH is one of those institutions in Sri Lanka. So they have set up a committee and they have set up standard operating procedures to address to uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. So it was, it happened in 2018, uh, but I, I'm not sure like it should be functioning, but recently I didn't. 
like uh, ask from none of them. I could I contacted none of them uh, to uh, see what is the situation now. So anyway, it is happy. I am happy that there are so many strategies or actions ongoing, and uh, uh, from the, that is for the work post, and also it is I have we I have highlighted throughout the thing. We have so many uh, actions or strategies to address sexual harassment, but how? What about and how about the other types of harassments uh, towards the workforce? Because sexual harassment is criminalized, it is easy to put onto the table and to develop a strategy or action. But how about the other types of violence? Because it makes our lives miserable. So this is something to think. So uh, from the patient's aspect, we have so many policy quality standards uh, put up, especially from some colleges. One example, SSEOG. Actually, they have set up patient quality uh, indicators. They have put quality indicators for patients' care, actually for the in the obstetric care. Uh, they have set up some guidelines and to ensure optimal management of women in labor. They are uh, further uh, expect that women will be treated by healthcare providers with respect and compassion. If someone is being treated respectfully and with compassion, no one can exert violence or harassment towards a patient. So these are in guidelines, but I conducted my research uh, in and around 2014-15. So the guidelines were there already, but they are most sense. So that is the reality. To conclude, to address harassment of women in health sector in Sri Lanka requires a multifaceted approach involving policy changes. We have to take actions from the highest possible levels and practice changes and also cultural shifts and increase support for victims. Actually, we have to develop new mechanisms to support victims because the support mechanism should have maintenance of privacy and confidentiality as the first guiding principle. If we can't maintain their privacy and confidentiality within this support system, so support services, it is an utter failure. So that we have to think about these aspects when we develop or when we establish a support system. I think I have discussed almost all which I wanted to discuss with you, some highlights. So these are the references. This is my motto, promote respect, foster dignity, stop past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dinosha, for that. Uh, for me, a person who worked in violence, your research teams, also made me wonder how much work we need to do further. We need to do further. It's, as you say, it's part of, health sector is part of the society. It's the deterioration of the society, but doctors as being doctors, we, where we have pledged to dedicate our lives to the service of the humanity. If a violence happens from us to our worker or to the patient, I think we are not doing our job. So thank you for this thought provoking um, argument and uh, now the uh, we have we have almost reached the full time but uh, for the audience here 
as well as uh, people who are on Zoom, uh, I open the um, open for questions. Go to the chat and see whether yeah, from the chat, uh, we don't have any questions. Uh, from the uh, people who are here in person. Um, anybody want to clarify? It's your time for the uh, speakers. You can put any questions to the speaker where you want to clarify. Uh, so actually, uh, I wanted to mention that at the PGIN, we started the course uh, on medical ethics and professionalism for all PGIN training uh, from 2004 even. We can actually involve teaching the ethics part of it. So, uh, I hope uh, that means the younger people, right, from 2014. Uh, I just hope uh, we should be the ones perhaps in the younger ones but for this input of ethics and professionalism or all trainings. And also, uh, you know, uh, I would like to mention that the SLMA Ethics Committee has been trying to introduce ethics, hospital ethics committee into the government hospital that we've had for a long time. Uh, and at last, so we have been uh, uh, we are going to say that we have succeeded to a certain extent, and we are uh, introducing a pilot project of having hospital after the surgery experiment and of clinical ethics, right? I mean, that's starting a pilot project, and that's all about ethics, or what we were talking about, right? And also, so uh, hopefully, in four Colombo hospitals, that we see a to that, and they will be introduced. Um, I think that's the same thing that I think as a as an administrator in the highest position, um, as a female, what can you do? Then it should be accompanied by a circular, a history circular. Otherwise, uh, you know, and uh, included in the reporting events. This quarterly every hospital uh, reports to us, or um, healthcare quality and safety. So if we can. Integrate this into the already established uh, reporting system uh, that we got. Otherwise, this is for the police. I just want to thank you, Bernie. Actually, I did want to ask you the question that you said that you have drawn up plans for the hospitals and you found it difficult to have this. Formal inquiries and informal, but it's actually informal inquiries. I have a few questions. What exactly do you mean by the informal inquiry? Is it uh, somebody who is not in the hospital sector doing it? Somebody from outside doing it? Because you said there were no papers, you couldn't find people, you said. And 
we can usually answer that questions that I can go on to next time. So the info inquiry system is like this is a value centered approach with the mobile inquiry system. Yeah, we have she has to uh, the team has to do the counting and go over the, the formal procedures of the inquiry system to some of the things. But the informal inquiry, it is just I don't like to say that the inquiry system, the informal system, it is a committee system like volunteer set up with the volunteers from the hospital. Who has that enthusiasm uh, and the uh, compassion towards this kind of uh, empathy, empathy and everything with all these kind of uh, situations where yeah, they like to uh, help the uh, victims because we can't pose any uh, kind of category to be uh, the committee members. Uh, in a female people from the hospital itself. Yeah, from the hospital itself. But the top top positions is like uh, uh, in the right line, it is uh, mentioned uh, senior matron or the other person of the, maybe it can be a retired person uh, 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 or an other person of the hospital or in that community can be the senior most person in the uh, uh, is the most uh, uh, the, President or some some chairs in the committee, uh, but the yeah, others are from the hospital itself because they feel that. But that's the question: like the same committee members can be the perfect way that the one was asking. Yeah. We, we have, I just want to share with you in the university, we have another grievance committees. We have not within the about the university sector at all. Maybe they were being um, uh, specialists. Even on the, the case, we have a system where you can send a grievance or a seal on with that and say it's a grievance directed to the grievance committee. The grievance could be against the dean. So dean doesn't go for the on with that. It goes into the grievance box. And as the administrator, I don't know him, I have to call him from the faculty board beside that group. Uh, Total outsiders who looks at the grievance, not even me, because I am inside first. What do I have head up to do? Because I could be the perpetrator. So it goes to somebody outside. That's I'm just sharing to say that because it will be more productive. And those people will be unbiased because they don't know the person. In you know, maybe they may know that it's a nurse or something or a doctor, but they will know them very close, not close, and they won't be biased in terms of repercussions. Mm -hmm. See, now we have a few things a big guy in the hospital. Hospital people may not volunteer. See, a minimum result is a way out. Don't just say, keep jump back. You can add it to it. Yes, we don't think you can do it. We can do it. Yes. And uh, then you have a quality. No, the important thing is that you have pain to even communicate. I think that the point is of course, you can have something to come in and the the members. Like, then how to kind of appear within the situation. We have a little bit of 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 a little bit and then can answer not here or nothing to be part of the monthly activity. And the second one you want to say is once the, the culprit is found, if you don't punish the parish, then there is no, I mean, rally is not the medical faculties because we suspect the students. Can you remember? Even in science faculties, they have to be the faculty or sometimes two years. And they were suspended for two years of their life, and they, they are being trained every one million in two years. So that's, that sends a message to the perpetrators. Actually, when through this informal mechanism, actually, the empowerment part is also happening in providing emotional support to the victim so that they come to a level that, yes, I want the perpetrator to be punished because they have no voice at the time they come to the informal committee. But the voice is up when they are going out of the, like, through the process. So that these are like, uh, 
And uh, uh, to contribute, um, I definitely know, Madam, um, it has been an autonomy in the university sector, and maybe because I'm a forensic medicine person, and uh, some of the doctors that undergo harassment uh, in the health sector has uh, spoken to me personally. So then what I do is uh, I, I connect them with uh, uh, with the Ministry of Health uh, gender focal point and uh, uh, from befriending as I think, uh, but then it's, it's the individual kind of a setup with that type of uh, uh, outreach in people should be there in any hospital where they can con contact that, that person may be giving empowerment. I think, Jenny, madam, you may have had how many students coming to you. I have that experience as well as doctors. So the the activities we do, I think, needs to be more regularized and uh, definitely popularized. So from the top, uh, so Mr. Madam, I'm, I'm pleading you as an academic, as well as a doctor, that a system is really needed if we look at the statistics in Sri Lanka, and it's a time that we we do something. And uh, I can say from SLNA Women's Cup because I know I was there in that book uh, which we drafted during um, uh, Nalika's uh, tenure as the chairperson with many stakeholders from ministry, administrators and everything. Uh, we are there as the chairperson um, with experts from different different fields. We are prepared to do um, anything further. So I think uh, it's now five fifteen. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Um, this is the uh, women so at least give a chance. For, Definitely, for sir. To ask question. You have something more. To <laughs> Oh, there is one question. There are some comments. <clears throat> one is about the group, analyzing the root cause for this gender bias uh, problems. Is the length of the cement. So you have to start from, you can't change when they come to the university. You have to start from in the garden of my education. So one of the ways that long run, we had abolish this girls' schools and boys' schools. Yes, we have mixed schools. So that's number one. Number two is that is that now we want to some of the statistics show that the nurses are the group in the population that mostly parents. Because that I don't think that there is any faculty, any university in this country where the, the doctors and the nurses and the other health professionals are, now it is happening to a certain extent, but are learning together. They may be learning in the same building, but not in the curriculum. I mean, there is no curriculum that is actually. Now, there are certain universities in the world where there is IT in the world, so they learn. So they learn together. So if they learn together, they know how to work together. In the long run, I think it's something that maybe in 2035, let's say, or 2040, in the long run, I think it will be better. Any other questions before we wind up? Yes, now it's uh, five.
20 and uh, I um, uh, I would uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Samantha to come to the podium to uh, do the concluding part. I would like to thank all the distinguished panelists on behalf of the Women's Health Committee of SLMA for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. And also a big thank you to our audience who, <clears throat> uh, who are present with us both physically and via Zoom um, for uh, taking part actively in this symposium and helping uh, your, your presence, which made it a successful symposium. Uh, thank you all and hope you have a pleasant evening and uh, we would like you to join us for tea. Thank you.